Okay, hello and welcome to the final video in the families and households section of this GCSE revision series. So uh, if you've not joined in before, you could go back and have a look at the five previous videos I've done. Uh, the first one introduces you to sociology and some of the basic concepts. Then I've done four or five all the way up uh, on the family topics. So go and have a look at them. Uh, today, what we're going to do, we're going to finish off by looking at the final stuff that you all have to need to know uh, for your GCSE on the first paper by considering how how we might criticize the role of families. So I've gone up into my top right hand corner in my little perch as usual, I quite like it up here actually. And this is what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to talk about criticizing the family. I'm gonna give you some ways we can criticize uh, the family. What we mean by that is why is it not particularly a good thing in society? We'll also have a look at a quick uh, typical exam question from the EDUCAS GCSE sociology spec. So this is the only thing, if you don't take the EDUCAS spec, that you will, will not be useful to you, basically. But if you do take it, it should be super useful to you. And then I'm going to finish off just by finishing something that I haven't really talked about today, or indeed in the previous videos, by focusing on the ageing population. So let's get into criticising the family. Like, what do we really mean by this? Well, as sociologists, uh, we need to not take everything at face value. We need to be critical of every kind of structure in society, including the family, and particularly about sociological theories of the role of the family. So last uh, video, video number five, I did a, about half an hour on the main theories, functionalism, Marxism, feminism, and the new right, and their views of the family. So if you want a bit more of a background on that, go and have a check out of that. You can also check out the podcast I've done on theories of the family, uh, which you can get by searching all sociology on Spotify, or indeed on iTunes. Now, Let's have a look at like four ways that we can start to criticise uh, the role of the family or what sociologists have said about the family. So first and foremost, it's about the, the, the way that sociologists have tended to focus on the nuclear family or what we might refer to, what they might refer to as the conventional family. So most uh, sociologists wrote about the nuclear family. They didn't really consider family diversity. And one of the things we've got to think about now is that society is very different from the likes of uh, when it used to be uh, perhaps in the times where like people like Marx, Durkheim, uh, Parsons, Murdoch were writing. And actually now, is the nuclear family as important as it once was? Probably not. And also we need to have, uh assume that we don't know an awful lot about the other types of families that have been uh, studied and that are existing, existing in society today. And so when we think about, well, what's the impact of family diversity have on the theories? We'll have a look at that in a moment. But a lot of them don't say anything about family diversity, not much in functionalism, not much in Marxism either. And that's primarily due to the time in which the, the theorists were actually writing. And it wasn't very diverse in Britain, but it is now. And so we need to bear that in mind that some of those theories, perhaps because they focus too much on the nuclear family, aren't as relevant today as they were 50, 60, 70, 100 years ago. All right. Um, dysfunctional families. So what we mean by this is that sometimes families aren't very good and they, bad things can happen. And that actually uh, the, the, the output of families can be damaging somewhat for society. So we, when we look at the functionalist role, this is very much considering the, 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 the theories that I looked at in the last uh, video that I, I gave on this. So when we look at the functionalist role of the family, all very positive about these functions that families are playing and they do these things very well and blah 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 but actually not all families play those functions not all families for instance taking Murdoch's idea um provide sexual satisfaction for each other families do break up not all families have someone providing the economic role if we think about the fact that in many families today lone parent families there isn't somebody to provide that instrumental and expressive role that parsons outlined who's going to do stabilizing of the adult personalities if there's only one person at home so again we can look at the fact that these older theories don't necessarily apply to families in our present contemporary society and I mentioned this when I talked about Marxism as well, but like Marxists say that every family supports the capitalist system. But what about those non-working families? What about families who aren't contributing to the system? Surely that's a criticism of those perspectives. Now, one of the key things that we think about when uh, considering how we might criticise the family is what's known as the dark side of the family. And this refers to anything bad that can happen in the family. So it could be domestic violence, domestic abuse, sexual violence, sexual abuse, child abuse, divorce, anything that's going to cause 
upset or sadness in families and all of those things would be would be part of that now these things are completely ignored by functionalists they take the positivist positivist well they do take the positivist side but i'm getting ahead of myself there they take a positive view on the role of the family where they ignore any of these dark sides or bad things that can happen in fact it's only really feminists who focus on the dark side of the family and the experience of women and how the family can be a patriarchal oppressive structure to them through things like um men exercising domestic uh, domestic abuse domestic violence but of course what we do need to be aware of is that one in four instances of domestic violence occur towards men so it's not just a one-way street as well and then finally we're going to consider about how equal families actually are so we've gone and talked about well i talked about in the, i think the third or the fourth video about changes in family roles and how we've moved from a more uh, segregated conjugal roles to more joint conjugal roles but we've still got inequalities that still exist families can be quite unhappy places for a lot of people particularly if the onus is on you to do a lot of that domestic work and again all of those theories ignore those inequalities really with the exception of feminism then marxism might take a bit of a look at some of those economic inequalities but it's only really feminism that focuses on those experiential inequalities so what someone's quality of life is like as a result of being in the family so there we go four ways that we can criticize the role of the family in society and i'm now going to give a four mark exam question as i said earlier this is the only time well, if you don't take the Educast GCSE that you want to skip forward on this or something, because this ain't going to be apply applicable to you. So here we go. Here's a very typical full mark exam question that you might get in your family's section, which asks you, explain why feminists criticise the nuclear family. Now, I'm going to talk you through how you might go about actually writing this. So first of all, what's the main thing that feminists say about the nuclear family? That it's patriarchal and that it's unequal to women. Give an example of this. OK, well, how can we think about that? Women do more domestic work than men at a social sociologist what who was that that was Anne Oakley or we could talk about Delphi and Leonard let's use a key word from Anne Oakley dual burden now all I've got to do now is put that together with some key words because your examiners are going to be looking for those key words things like patriarchy female oppression uh conjugal roles inequality dual burden and of course your names of your sociologists and Oakley or Delphi and Leonard or whoever it might be so let's have a look at how we might actually apply all this together so this is a four out of four answer um, feminists criticised the nuclear family for creating inequality between men and women. If we go back to what I asked you to consider, first of all, that's the main thing that women, feminists say about the nuclear family. They argue that nuclear families are patriarchal structures, keyword there, where men dominate women. For example, this is me adding in an example and a sociologist. Oakley suggests that women experience a dual burden of doing paid work and domestic work in nuclear families, while men only experience a single burden of paid work. That is a really good example. It's about the same kind of length that you're looking for. You get four marks. And what you'll need to do is say one thing. You'll then need to develop it and you will need to use some keywords. in it. So if you look to write somewhere between sort of four and six lines, you'll be absolutely fine. Get your sociologists in there. Get your keywords in there. OK. Now, just finishing this series of family videos off by considering some of the other big changes that have happened in families and, and, and society over the last sort of like 100 years. So on the screen here, what I've got is a graph showing life expectancy. So how long people can expect to live. So if we go back and we look at 100 years ago, the average life expectancy somewhere, as we can see there, between 55 roughly for a man with the green line and about 60 for women with the purple line. Now, if we move towards let's say i assume that if you are watching this video you're probably going to be someone who is taking the gcc shortly so you've probably been born somewhere around like 2005 your life expectancy is massively increased so if we look at the life expectancy there of a man we're looking at somewhere in the region of about 73 74 years old and women well up there into um into their 80s sorry men but far closer to actually about 75 women far closer up there towards uh, just above 18 in fact a child born today uh would have absolute chance of living well beyond 90 so one of the things we can say is that life expectancy has greatly increased over the course of the 20th century now what's the impact of this and well we've got a few things we can say firstly is that we have an aging population people get people live longer they get older they don't die as quickly as they used to and this has got massive consequences for society so like how do we care for people who perhaps are too old to look after themselves what about the health provisions that we need to put forward so uh, as, as people get older they have more health complications we need to look after that 
when people don't work anymore, they need to be in receipt of pensions. And so if people are living longer, that, that pension money needs to last longer. It's something that we haven't really considered as society's developed. And so the age of retiring for pensions hasn't really gone up that much, given the fact that people live an awful lot longer. We saw earlier somewhere in the region of about 20 or 30 years longer. But we can also see how age is changing and what we might consider to be old might be very different to what we used to consider to be old. So when we consider, let's think of people who are like age 60 type thing, there are loads of film stars, there are even some pop stars that one, look really good, are still living a really active, healthy life. And so the age of someone who might be 60 today is not necessarily considered old, certainly in the way that we used to consider people as being old. So basically what I'm saying here is that the way we see age is, is different and because people are getting older it's like you don't get older until you get much much older so I've described I've explained that so poorly I'm just going to move on so the next thing we're going to talk about is um, how family structures have changed so if people are living longer what we have uh, we might expect to see is more people living in extended families but that doesn't really happen particularly in the way that I described an extended family I think in the second video which is basically you live with anyone other than your immediate generation as mum and dad children so you might live with your grandparents your aunties your uncles etc now what happens now is rather than us living with our older relatives what we might do is perhaps live a bit further away but keep in touch with them a lot more often through things like mobile phone calls texts uh, zoom or anything like that and so what we've had is a change from the original classic extended family where you all live together to what we now might call a modified extended family where you don't have to live with your older relatives but you will stay in touch with them perhaps as frequently as you might have done if you lived with them okay so a modified extended family is the new name for how you might not live with your grandparents for instance but you might have a lot of contact with them sorry it's a nice, nice little sip of tea there um, the other thing we can talk about is grandparents are often now called upon to do childcare, especially with the fact that both parents tend to work. That's a neo-conventional family, if you'll remember. Both parents work in neo-conventional or dual earner family. You're going to need someone to pick up that childcare because childcare is incredibly expensive. So grandparents often called upon to help with childcare. They get older, they can do it for longer. But the other thing we want to consider is as families get older and people get older, especially when it comes to their health care and their, their social care needs, someone's going to have to look after these people and they might not necessarily be ill or their health might not be a problem it might just be the case that they can't do things that they might used to be able to do so for instance cooking for themselves cleaning etc etc and so what we've seen is we've seen a rise of what we call the sandwich generation which if you know a sandwich is like you know two bits of bread and something in the middle what we mean by the bit in the middle is the people who have to care for older relatives so perhaps their older relatives who have care needs who can't cook and clean for themselves but also younger relatives as well. So it might be uh, kids who have left the nest and then come back, so like boomerang kids. And we find that middle-aged women, and what I mean by that is women aged somewhere between around 40 to 60, are the ones in this sandwich generation. They're the ones caught in the middle, caring for older and for younger relatives. So another consequence of rising life expectancy and aging populations. But it's not like, I think what's kind of interesting about the aging population is the way that in what the way we kind of deal with it in Britain is very different to how we might look at it in other cultures, for instance. So when people get older, they tend to live in a variety of household types. It might be they live continually with their partner. It might be they tend to live alone. They might move in with you in an extended family. They might live in a care home or something else. But in other cultures, like particularly the South Asian culture, which is what I mentioned in video three. So I'm talking about India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, those kind of countries and cultures from, from those kinds of parts of the world tend to invite their elder older relatives to live with their families in a classic extended family. So this tradition isn't dead by any means. It just tends to be kept alive by um, not by everyone, but perhaps smaller communities and smaller cultures. So in this case, we're talking about uh, South Asian families. OK, so that's just going to bring everything to a close. And this is the final uh, video on the family topic. So just to recap what we've done today, we've looked at ways we can criticise the family, fundamentally looking at how we can criticise the theories that have um, had a say on particularly nuclear families, ignoring the role of family diversity. We can talk about, for instance, the way that the dark side of the family is often ignored and also thinking about how things are not always positive in families and that there are quite bad, nasty things that happen dysfunctions that we'd either rather not think about or rather not focus on.
I gave you an example of a typical full mark exam question there, which was uh, for the Educast GCSE specification. And that sort of question would crop up in paper one with your families. And we looked at how we might compose an answer to that based on what we'd looked at in previous sessions. And then finally, I just finished it all off there by considering the impact of the ageing population, featuring things like the role of the sandwich generation, uh, like the role of increased care needs, pension provision, those kind of things, and as well as the fact that in different cultures, older people are kind of um, helped in slightly different ways when it comes to their living situation. So perhaps in British culture, we might have a more of an archetype to put people into a care home if they get if they have care needs. But in South Asian cultures, uh, they will often invite the older relative into their household to become part of a classic extended family. It's just part of their family and their um, and their culture. OK, so there we go. We've uh, we've finished the, se the season of videos, the session of videos. Um, but all that's to say is to say thank you very much for sticking with me through these six. If you've watched them all, well done. I uh, hope they've been helpful for you. What I'm doing next is I'm going to be working up a few on education, which is another topic that will crop up in your first paper of GCSE Educast Sociology. So I'm going to do a few videos on education. I'm going to do one on uh, research methods. And altogether, that will complete 10 videos. And those 10 videos will basically be your revision for the first paper of GCSE Educast Sociology. All right. So I hope you've enjoyed it. You know what to do. If you found it useful by now, like it, share it, subscribe to it, go visit us visit us on Instagram or whatever you need to do. And that's it for the time being. So I hope you found the family unit helpful. If you need any questions or if you need any support, drop me an email, hello at allsociology.co.uk or go visit me on my Instagram at allsociology. Thanks very much, people. Peace out. Look after yourselves and goodbye.